Again, welcome to DSRT 734 class. And this is inferential statistics in decision making. In this lecture, we're going to discuss about different types of graphs, namely the stem and leaf plot, the dot plot, pie chart, and also scatter plot. Stem and leaf plot and also the dot plots are very good for quantitative data. Pie chart is good for categorical data. And then the scatter plot is good when we have a data set with two variables. Uh, for example, we want to find the relationship between hours of a study and the grade. So we want to know if a student grade depends on the number of hours he's study or reading and also the outcome of the grade. Also pie chart can be used for quantitative data but in terms of, again, pie chart, we can have more than one categories of uh, items we want to look for. Again, we'll see an example soon. So our main objective, again, is to graph quantitative data using stem and leaf plots and also dot plots. So graphing quantitative data using stem and leaf and then dot plots. Also, we are going to graph qualitative data using the pie charts and also Pareto charts. And we're going to di discuss about that. And also graph a pair data set using scatter plot and time series chart. Again, as we said, the scatter plot is very good when I have two variables I want to compare. Let's say we have X values and Y values. X will be our independent variable, uh, which will be horizontal. Y value will be our dependent. Uh, dependent variable. Now we want to see the relationship between the two. When S increase, does Y increase or decrease? Or when S increase, it doesn't matter about Y. And in this very item, we're going to talk about coalition coefficient, and I will discuss more about how to find, especially for linear relationship, to find relationship between the degree of strength or the certainty of uh, uh, two variables. Time series chart is the same as scatter plots. The difference is that in a time series chart, we are trying to find a relationship between a variable and the time. So always the independent variable, which is the X axis, will be a period of time. Either it can be yearly, seconds, minutes, weekly, daily. But the time series chart is the same as scatter plots by the horizontal or the independent variable is a time period. So we start with graphing the quantitative data using the stem and leaf plots. And in the stem and leaf plot, when we have a data set, the leading digit we can assign stem to it and also the, uh, the next digit, the single digit will be the leaf. So we will use this example to explain here we say each number, stem and leaf plot, each number is separated into stem and also a leaf. So for example, a quantitative data is given here, 21, 25, 25, 26, 27, 28, 30, 36, 36, 45. This is a quantitative data. Now the main reason why we plot uh, stem and leaf using our data is to see, the goal again is to organize our data and also we can see the distribution of the data, whether the data is a normal distribution, whether it's skewed to the right, whether it's skewed to the left. And also we can find the median from the, from the stem and leaf plot. So for example, let's say I have 1,000 customers uh, purchases. And now I want to know a customer who purchase $50 or more of an item. You don't want to go through from beginning to the end to check all the, and the customers, thousand customers to find how many customers purchase more than $50. So in this case, I can organize my data using stem and leaf plots. So when I come to the stem and leaf plot, I say, okay, 50, so maybe my stem is five. So I'll go to five and I'll count all the purchases that is more than 50 or $50 or the five. 
So let's look at this. This is a very small data, so we can't see the main reason behind semi-link plot. But again, we use it to organize our data set. If this data set should be, let's say, over 1 million or let's say 10,000, and I'm looking for a specific value, I don't want to go through all the 10,000 uh, lists of customers or patients. So if I organize the data as a stem and leaf plot, I'll just go through the category by looking at the stem, then go through the category. So now how do we plot the stem and leaf? And the first thing we look at our data, the minimum and also the maximum, and we'll look how many digits for each data. Here is very simple, we have only two digits. So we are going to use the leading digit as our stem, and then the next digit will be our leaf. Now, sometimes also we may try to plot our graph and the graph will be too squeezed. That is, we, you can see the pattern. We can divide it, the digit into two, say from 20 to 25, then 26 to 30. So we get two rows instead of one row. But here we look at our data, okay. So we have 20s, 30s and 40s. So you can see our stem, two, three, four. Now the leaf is the single digit, so I'll start with 21. 21, the leaf is one, so I'll write down the one. The next, the leaf is five, I'll write down the five. We, have, we also have to write all the values, so including the duplicate. So the next value also is 25, I'll write down the five again. Next is 26, I'll write down the six. 27, I'll write down the seven. 28, I'll write down the eight. The next value is 30, 30 is three. So I'll go to the stem three, and the next digit is zero, so I'll write down the zero. Next value is 36, so the leaf is six. Another 36, the leaf again is six. The next is 45, the leaf, and the stem is four, the leaf is five. So this will be our stem and leaf plot. So we can see how the day, again, this is a very few data, but we can see how our data is organized. Now, if I'm looking for 36, I'll just go through the third, uh, second row where I have my three as the stem. And I'll look for the leaf. Unless I'm looking for 34. There's no 34 here. So again, we can also see the shape. This look like skew again to the right because the, low, the higher part have a small data. So the higher part, which is 45, have a thin tail, so which means it's skewed to the right. And we may discuss this more detail. For example, when a data set is skewed to the right, it means the mean value is greater than the median. When it's skewed to the left, which means the thin tail will be at the lower side, beginning of the graph. It means the media is greater than the mean. Now, if most of the data is in the middle and the first and third is almost the same size, then we may look something like a symmetric, which would be the normal distribution. The normal distribution means the mean and the media are the same. Now, we have a formula for finding the skewness of a, a distribution or a graph. The formula for finding the skewness of a graph is the mean minus the media over standard deviation. So if the mean is the same as the media, then what will happen? We get zero. The skewness will be zero. So if the skewness is zero, it means we have a symmetric and distribution. So that's the concept. Again, we may discuss this in the uh, future lectures, but for now, we should know how to plot the stem and leaf plot. So now if the digit is a decimal value, yes, there's a way we can do it also. We may decide to use the leaf part, I mean the decimal part as a leaf, and the whole number as a stem. Now, let's say if it's a three digit, the same thing we can say, okay, we are going to use the first two digits as the stem, and the last digit as the leaf. And now if the, Values are very many, and there's so many in one category. Let's say in this case, we can see 20 is like six times six. But let's say this data is over 50, and 20 is like 30. We can't keep everything in one place. 
we can divide it into two. So we say we go two, two, three, three, four, four. The first two will be from zero to five. Second two will be from six, uh, six to nine, or zero to four, five to nine. So here we say the stem and leaf plot is also similar to histogram, which, which is the purpose of it. We use histogram like frequency table, which we covered in our previous lesson, frequency table and histogram. What we said about it is that we use those two items again, or those two tools to organize our data. Stem and leaf plot also is the same. We use them to organize our, we use the stem and leaf plot to organize our data, similar as we use histogram and frequency distributions. When it still contains original data values, now the difference, I would say the stem and leaf is better than frequency table because in frequency table, we don't see the original value. Remember we have a class, which is the class width. Here I can say, okay, from two to, two to four or 20 to 30 or 25 to 10, how many values we have between. So that means we don't see the value, but we know that between some interval, the class width, we know how many values fall in that range. The advantage of semi leaf plot is that you can see the original values. So from, for example, using the frequency distribution, I cannot find the median because I can't see the original values. But here we can find the median. I will say, okay, this is 10 values. So the fifth and sixth value, I'll find the average of seven plus eight divided by two. That will give me the median. So the stem and leaf, again, as mentioned here, still contains the original data values. So this is a very good example now. Here we have three digit values. So here they say the following are the numbers of text message sent last month by cell phone users on one floor of a college dormitory. Now they say we should display the data in stem and leaf plots. Now, this is what we mentioned. For example, if I'm looking for student that spent over 120 minutes, I need to go through all the lists from beginning to the end. We go through all the lists. And these are a lot of values. Uh, if I'm looking for 119, then I'll go through the list to see if how many 119 I have. So this is why we are using, we can also use the frequency table here we are using stem and leaf plot, or we can use also use histogram to organize this data so that when I'm looking for a specific value, I don't have to go through all the lists. I will just go through the category where I know the value will fall within. So now stem and leaf, first step, we have three digits. Okay, we decided we are going to use two digits as a stem and the last digits as the leaf. And by convention, most textbooks, that's how it is. Three digits, the best way you use the two first two digits as your stem, then the last digit as your leaf. Now look at the lowest value and look at the highest value. So that's what we're going. So here we look, the data entries go from low, the lowest value is 78, the highest value is 159. So that's okay. The reason why we have to look for both two values, so we know where our stem value will start from. I don't want to start the stem value from 10, 10, 20, 30, when the minimum value is 78. So since it's 78, I can start my stem from 70. And since it's, it doesn't go up to 1,000, if it's 1,000, that would be too long. So instead of saying 70, 18, 8, 90, I would say 70. I'll have a 20 or 50 interval between if the range is very high. So here, I know 70 to 50, uh, 70 to 15, that's enough. That will give us only seven or eight. So we're going to make it one interval, 70, 80, 90, up to 150. So let's see. So we start with uh, 78, we should make the leaf 78. 159, we should make it 15.9, which means we are starting from 70 to 150. So which will be 7, 8, 9, 10, up to 15. 
So they say the least term will start from 7 to 15, which is 70 to 150. Okay, so that's the first thing we look. Based on the lowest value and the highest value, I will know where to start my stem from, what value to start from, and what should be the interval of the values. So for each data entry, now list the leaf to the right of his stem. So we can see how we are. We have only 78. This means we don't have no 80 and 90 values. But the reason why we start from 78 again, because we have it. But when you look at the values, I want us to look. You can see that all of them are three digits. I set one value, which is two digits, 78. Apart from that, all the values are three digits. So that's why our we have only 78. There's not in 80, there's not in 90. Both are two digits. Then we have a lot of from 100 all the way to 150. So we look at the list, we have 100. We have a uh, first value will be, uh, the 10, again, some textbook will write times x 10 here, which is times 10. So that we know that this value is by 10. So when I, when I see 10, I say 100. When I see 11, I say 110, because it's from 70 to 150. So the first value will be 105. We have 105, we have 108, 109, we have 3109. Then 116, 114, again 112, uh, 12, 12, 2. And we keep going, so this is the list. So you can see 180, we have two here. And three, 118. So we have only three 180. Let's see if that's what they got here. Uh, actually they have here yeah, three. So one, two, three. This is the first, first time we go through all the list step by step and we put all the value, but always we have to put it in order. So this is on order stem and leaf plot. So I'll come here, ordered stem and leaf plot. If it's on ordered, I cannot find the media. Remember to find the media, we have to sort our value first, then take the middle value. So we put them in order. So now I can see we have 3180. We also have 3112. Let's go back. So we have 112, 12. And then three, so we have three, one, twelve. So again, this is three digits, so we use the first two digits as our stem. Mm -hmm. The lowest value is 70, so we start from seven or 70. We end at 15, which is also called 150, because that's the highest value. It's 159. And that's what we said earlier here. Uh, was it 78 to the high of 159? So we know the beginning and the end of the value, minimum and maximum. That's what we're going to use to set the stem. Then we look at each value and we plug it. So this now the data is organized. Now, when we look at this data, it looks like a little bit like normal distribution because most of the values is in the middle but not symmetric, not perfect. So now we go to how do we do the dot plot. Dot plot also is very straightforward. In the dot plot, the only thing we do, we draw horizontal line and we start with our measure. Again, here we have different values now. The minimum value is 21, the maximum is 45. So I may have a measurement starting from 20 to 45. Anywhere I see a value, I'm going to put, that's why it's called dot plot. I'll put a dot. So you can see 21 is only one. We have one dot. 25, we move from 22, 20, 24. 25 is two dot. Why? Because we have two. 225. So 125 is a dot. Another 25 dot. So if you have the same value, the dot will be on top of each other. Now, if I have 325, then I'll get three dots here. We also have 126, we also have 127 a dot, we have 128 a dot, then we have 30 dot. 
Then 36 is 2, so we have two dots, one on each other. Then the last value is 45, 45 dots. So dot plot means just draw a straight line, make sure you measure it, look at the minimum and maximum value here, the minimum is 21, the maximum is 45. So I can draw a straight line whereby I'll start from 20 to 45. Then anywhere I see a number, I will represent it with a dot. So we're going to use the same example again for the dot plot. So this is, these are the values again. So since the lowest value is 78, the highest value is 159, we said, okay, we're going to draw a long horizontal line and we'll measure it from 70 to 160. And that's what we have here, 70 to 160. Then we just look at the values. First value is 78, so we have only one 78 plot. The next value is 105, so we come all the way to 105. There's no any value in 80s, 85, 90, 95 category. Then we also have 109, then we have 3, 110, so three dots. And we plot all the dots. So next is graphing a qualitative data set. And first we can use a pie chart. A pie chart normally is a circle which can be divided to any number of sectors. It depends on the categories I have. For example, if I want to have a pie chart of a true or false of some outcome, then I may have only two sectors. Uh, if the category is three, let's say, uh, no smoker, low smoker, medium smoker, uh, high smoker, or large. So in this case, I can have four. So I'll divide it into four settings. And the size of the setter will depend on each answer percentage. So the whole, again, circle is 100%, or we can also use the term 360 degree. Now based on percentage of each setter, we may draw the, the size of the setter. We'll show. So here yeah, we want to have an example to construct a pie chart. We have vehicle type, cars, trucks, motorcycle, others. So this means we're going to have four sectors. By looking at the value, uh, 18,440 kill. So the cars sector will be the largest, 18,000. Trucks will be the next large. Motorcycles will be the next, and the last smallest one will be the other. Now, when we want to plot the circle, we have two options. If you like, we can change uh, the answer to a degree or to radian. Radian means 360, uh, 360 degree, change it to radian. But the concept here is that, okay, I can add all these values to get a total kill. Then I'll find what's similar to relative frequency. I will divide 18,440 by the total, and that will give me the part, portion of the car sector. Then 13,778 divided by the total, 4,553 divided by the 8,893 divided. So that will give us all the percentage. Then multiply by 100 to get the percentage of each. So this is how we start to use the frequency. So we find the part now. So 18,440 divided by the total, 37,594. Then 13,778 divided by the total. And then 4,553 divided by the total, which is right here. Give us 0 0.12. Then 823 divided by the total will give us 0 0.02. Then if we want to name this in percentage, we'll say the cost is 49%. Trucks are 37%, motorcycle is 12%, and other is 2%. But again, the whole concept is like finding proportion of each side or frequency. We did this in the previous. So you can see this table look it's exactly as a frequency table. Frequency table. Vehicle type will be our label. This is quantitative, so we don't have no class weight. There's no class weight in quantity. 
sorry, qualitative, qualitative uh, categorical data or nomina. So there's no any class. If it's quantitative data, then we may have a class intervals. Then you can see that we had a frequency, we can find the relative frequency, so that will give us the portion. So with this now, we can plot our graph. As I said earlier, I will change it to radians if you want, because again, circle is 360 degree. So to find the central angle, multiply 360 by the category relative frequency. And that will give, so if it's 0.49, if I multiply by 360, that will give me the set, uh, the degree, because the total degree of a circle is 360, not 100%. Then next, we get the same 360, 0 0.37, 0 0.12, 0 0.02 times 360. So we can see our degree here. When we had all this degree, it should give us 360. And we can see from here, this is 7. 43 is 50 degree, 176, 133, that will give us uh, one, uh, that will give us 309, so almost like three, because this is nine, this is zero, 309, 309 plus 50, again, because of the, approximation of the decimals, it gave us 359. But it should be, again, we all know that total is 360. Should be 360. So from here now, we can plot our circle, which we call the pie chart. So the pie chart is a circle. We can see the truck side. The car is the most largest, 49%. We are using the percentage here. Trucks is 37. Motorcycle is two up. So again, that's uh, the pie chart. And the next is the parental chart. So in parental chart, it's a vertical bar, almost like a column chart a vertical bar graph in which the height of each bar will represent the frequency or relative frequency. So a parental chart is the same as a bar chart and almost like histogram, but with histogram, there's no space between. And parental chart is good for, remember histogram is for quantitative. Histogram is for quantitative data. Uh, but again, Parental chart is for qualitative, which is the same as bar chart. So here we have a vertical bar. And now we have an example here constructing a parental chart. They say in the recent year, the retail industry lost 41.0 million in inventory shrinkage. The inventory shrinkage is the loss of inventory through either the breakage or peverage or shoplifting and so on. So the cost of this inventory shrinkage administrative error is 7.8 million. Employee theft, 15.6. Shop lifting, 14.7 million. And also the vendor fraud, which is 2.9 million. Now they say we should use the parental chart to organize this data. So next step, we write the table down, which we will say the administrative error price, uh, I mean the cost, employee theft, shop, shop lifting, and then the vendor. So with this, we can plot our parent, parental chart. Uh, we say, okay, we start with the employee, uh, admin, shop lifting. It, it doesn't matter which one we start first with. But the reason why we start with employees is that employee is the biggest or the highest. So we get employee theft, shop lifting. The vertical is our millions of dollars and our horizontal is a categorical data or nomina. This is qualitative. Employee theft, shoplifting, admin error, then a vendor fraud. We can also graph a paired data set. This is other, we we'll use the term paired. This is finding the relationship between two variables. So an example is given here. We have X and Y. 
always the horizontal is our independent variable, independent, then the y is dependent. So x value should determine y. As you show in this pattern here, we can see that when s increase, y decrease. So we have a decreasing uh, relationship. And we may discuss this more when we do correlation coefficient and regression. But here we learn how to plot the, the chart, which we call the scatter plot. So based on the data given to us, we just have to plot each point. Each point have what? Two value, the x value and the y value, or the horizontal value and the vertical. So we plot. Then we look at the pattern, how the points relate. In this example here, we say it's decreasing because when X is small, Y is very big. As S is getting bigger, Y is reducing. So this is a decreasing relationship. So we have an example here. They say a British statistician, Ronald Fisher, introduced a famous data set called the Fisher's Harris data set. This data set describes various physical categories, such as the pater length, the pater width, for three species of iris. And then the pater length form the first data set, and the pater width form the second data set. And as the pater length increase, what, can, what tends to be happening to the pater width? So let's look here. We can see that as the pater length increase, the pattern width also increase. This is an increasing order. So each point in the scatter plot represents the pattern length and the pattern width. So at one point I have two values. The X values horizontal and the Y value vertical. But Y value is called the pattern width and then the horizontal which is X values is called pattern length. By looking at the part of the data we can see that as the length increase, the width also increased. So the relationship between the pattern length and pattern width is an increasing relationship. And this is what here we interpret. We say from the scatter plot, you can see that the pattern length increases, the pattern width also tend to increase. So we have increasing relationship. So a scatter plot is very good. When we want to find the relationship, between two variables. I it to be an increasing relationship or decreasing, or there's no, if the points are scattered everywhere, scattered everywhere, uh, some point is when S is high, the Y is high. Some points say when S is high, Y is low. And everything scattered. Or when S is low, Y is low. Another point when S is <clears> high, <throat> Y is still low. So we say there's no relationship, but three major difference will come. Either increasing, decreasing relationship or no relationship. Then we also have different, this is linear, but we also have a non-linear relationship. Uh, so like a polynomial, exponential relationship increasing very rapidly, etc. And those, again, can be plot using a scatter plot, finding relationship between two variables. We also have a time series graph. A time series graph is the same as the previous graph we talked about, the scatter plot. The only thing is that the x axis or the horizontal is always a time, it's a period of a time. So, for example, let's go back to our scatter plot. If this should be a time, let's say yearly, the horizontal is yearly. And then let's say Y is uh, expenses. Then it's a time series. Time series, why? Because we are trying to find if there's a relationship between whatever Y is, let's say Y is expenses. Is there a relationship between the total expenses the company spend with the time? So, which means as time increases, as the years go, the expenses goes down, or the expenses uh, goes up, or there's no any effect, uh, no any relationship. So we use again scatter plot as we say, find the relationship between two variables, as we can see here. 
But time series also the same thing. By here, for example, we have a quantitative data and we want to find the relationship of it with the time. When the time increase, the quantitative data increase. But when it reaches mass position, even when the time is increasing, it goes down. The quantity goes down. So again, use the time series chart to graph any data set with time. So here you can see our time is what yearly. So here they see a table list the number of cellular telephone cellular telephone subscribers in millions for the year 1995 through 2005. Construct a time series chart for the number of cellular subscribers. Our goal is that we want to know if the time have anything to do with the, the number of subscribers. As the years goes by, the number of subscribers increase. But when we look at the data set, it seems there's a relationship. And it's an increasing relationship. You can see as the years goes increasing, the subscribers also increasing. So here we're going to have an increasing relationship. First, the horizontal axis represent and the years, as we said, always the X axis is years. That's the time series. And not only years, it can be any time period. It can be in minutes, it can be in week, and daily, uh, doesn't but Again, the X axis is a time period. The Y axis will represent, in this case, the number of subscribers in millions. But it can represent anything depends on our studies. Now we plot the pair data and connect them with a line segment. So this is what we get. We can see that this is an increasing order. So the graph shows that the number of subscribers have been increasing since 1995 with greater in increases recently. So this will be the conclusion of our lectures on graphs. In this lectures, we discuss about, again, what is a stem and leaf plot, and also what is a dot plot. We use the stem and leaf plot and dot plot to plot quantitative data. Then later on, we also learn a pie chart, which we use a qualitative data for, and also we learn about the parental chart. And the next was the scatter, the scatter plot. Again, if you want to find relationship between two variables, so you may have the X variables, Y, then you plot the dots and see if there's any increasing or decreasing relationship, or there is no relationship at all. We also talk about our last uh, graph, which is the time series. Time series graph, again, is the same as scatter plot. The only thing, actually, the reason why it's called time series, because the horizontal value X is always in time. It can be any time period, either yearly, weekly, daily, etc. So those are the few charts that we cover in this section. And most of these charts, again, we can use uh, statistics, uh, programs, applications to create them. For example, I can use Excel for most of all the charts or SPSS program also. And again, we're going to do a lab work as time goes on. In this class, we're going to use the SPSS, so we may have lab work on that. Also, the school gave us the SPSS license to use, so we may have lab work. Again, wish you the best, and if you have any question, again, send an email, and thank you.